In this last video segment, I want to look at some other trade models that help answer questions that the Ricardian model and the supply and demand model don't really do a good job of answering. And the first one is what we call the increasing returns to scale model. And increasing returns to scale comes in a couple of different varieties. The easiest to understand is the idea that larger firms have a lower average cost of production than smaller firms. And this can often lead to monopoly if we're having no international trade because one firm can grow large enough to entirely serve the entire domestic market. If we have international trade though, each local monopolist will then take advantage of the opportunity to send their product to the other one, other country. So that if we had one monopoly car producer in South Korea and one monopoly car producer in Japan, if the car company in Japan tries to raise prices really high, the company in South Korea will enter the market in Japan, sending their cars there, competing with the Japanese monopolist producer, and so leading to a situation where, although we have monopoly of production in one country, the monopolist producer does not have 100% market share. And so we can get many of the advantages of economies of scale, efficient production because we have these large production runs, but we don't end up with the monopoly problem that we would if we just had a domestic producer as the only supplier. And when you go out there and look, a lot of trade, 25% of the world trade, is between rich countries to other rich countries and trading manufactured goods with each other. And so essentially, a lot of what happens is that there's trade between countries because, or between U.S. states even, because firms just happen to be located somewhere. They have to be located somewhere, and one set of firms might w locate itself in Wisconsin, and another set might locate itself in Minnesota, and they send their products ag across each other's borders. Um, there's a couple of different types of increasing returns to scale that get more interesting, though. So one way of looking at increasing returns to scale is there might be what we call learning by doing. And you imagine that as a country produces more, they develop a tradition of doing something and they learn how to do it well. What's going to happen then is that the location of an industry may end up being a historical accident, that whoever started the industry first gets a head start on gaining this experience, and then they keep that head start. And as I'll show you in the next slide, this may actually be sort of inefficient. And this is a specific example of what's called path dependence. Path dependence is the idea that where you end up depends on where you start. And that's actually not a feature of something like the supply and demand model. If we start with a low price or start with a high price, we always end up with that same equilibrium. In technology, this often um, is claimed to play an important role. So the example there is, why do we have the keyboard layout that we do where the top row is Q-W-E-R-T-Y? Um, and the story goes back to early mechanical typewriters where to keep people from typing so fast that the keys would jam, they put some of the most frequently used keys like E and R and T up where it's actually less convenient rather than immediately under your fingers where it would enable you to type the fastest. And essentially, once that started, everyone got locked into it, even though we now have electronic devices where the keys aren't going to get jammed up like that. One way of thinking about this learning by doing situation is imagine we think about something like watches. And we think about the cost to produce a watch of a given quality level depends on the total number of watches ever made in a country because the total number of watches ever made helps establish a skill set and a historical tradition and so on and so forth. And it might be that in some sense 
maybe Switzerland really isn't the place to make watches. Maybe that, you know, for any given level of experience, for any given level of total watches made, Switzerland has a higher cost per equivalent quality than Singapore. But you can see if Switzerland has a big enough head start, then even though Singapore is really the more efficient producer of watches, that we're going to end up with latecomer Singapore unable to catch up with experienced Switzerland. So there's this sort of thinking sometimes gives at least theoretical justification to what's called the infant industry argument for trade protection. That essentially we have to give trade protection long enough for our infants in Singapore to gain experience so that they'll be able to compete with the established firms somewhere else. But as many people have said, the trouble with this is the infants never seem to grow up. As long as the firm in the less experienced country knows that it has trade protection and knows that it won't have to experience with experience the competition of larger, more established firms, then it's going to have a hard time getting its game up without that spur of competition. The other model I'd like to talk about here is what's called the heckscher olin model. And the idea of the heckscher olin model is we want to go back to that Ricardian model and try to think about where does comparative advantage come from. And as this italicized definition or statement here says, this is kind of complicated, but countries have the comparative advantage in the good that intensively uses the factor of production that they have and comparative abundance. I don't really expect that to make sense first time around. That is a lot of language. So let's think about two different concepts. The first concept is the factor intensity of a good. And I'm going to use rice and beef as examples here. So rice uses a lot of water per unit of land. You grow rice in flooded fields. So rice is water intensive. Beef uses less water per unit of land. And as it says here, if it's less water per unit of land, then it also means more land per unit of water. So beef is not water intensive. In fact, beef is land intensive. So you can see where each of the two different goods uses a different mix of water versus land. And that defines which one intensively uses water and which one intensively uses land. The second concept is the idea of comparative factor abundance. So California is a bigger state than Nevada. So on one level, it would look like land is more abundant in California. But it's also true that California has more water than Nevada. And its advantage in water is way bigger than its advantage in land. So as it says here, the ratio of water to land would be higher in California. So although California has more of both, it has a comparative abundance, and you can see where this relates back to the idea of comparative advantage. California has a comparative abundance of water. Its abundance of water, its advantage in water, is bigger than its abundance or advantage in land. The other way around for Nevada. Because Nevada has relatively little water per unit of land, its land per unit of water ratio is high in Nevada. So we say that land has a comparative abundance, sorry, Nevada has a comparative abundance of land. So then the idea here is each country or region is going to have the comparative advantage in the good that plays to its strengths, or at least doesn't play to its weakness. So although Nevada has less of each, it's less crippled when it comes to land so it should specialize in beef, which, where its shortage of land is less of a hindrance. On the other hand, although California has more water and more land, its advantage is biggest in water, so it should produce rice, which plays to its biggest strength. And that's the idea of the Heckscher-Olin model, that this idea of comparative factor abundance 
and the factor intensity of different goods dictates which goods are produced where. So countries that have a lot of unskilled labor, but not a lot of human capital or uh, physical capital are going to specialize in light industry, we call it. Things like assembling parts and making other things. On the other hand, countries that don't have a lot of unskilled labor and do have a lot of skilled labor are going to specialize in innovation and research and knowledge intensive industries like software and so on and so forth. Um, and that's basically the pattern that we tend to see out there when we look at world trade, that countries like the United States where, believe it or not, unskilled labor is actually relatively scarce compared to many other countries, tend to not specialize in industries that mostly require a lot of unskilled labor. Instead, they specialize in things like pharmaceuticals and IT and Hollywood, which does require you know, human capital, obviously, of a particular type. And that is that. <laughs>